people are still sort of rolling in, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm Kate. Um, I am the director of Environment Maryland, and I am so excited that you all are here. I am beyond excited that it is October and officially spooky season. Your girl is a Libra, and so it is truly my time to absolutely shine. Um, thank you all for joining us for Conservation Conversations. Bridget and I have been doing this series since April now, um, which is crazy to think about, and I'm really excited to see so many of you all sticking with us. Um, mm -hmm. We started Conservation Conversations um, really as a place to, to provide an opportunity for people to connect and to have conversation in um, a pandemic and when we were all in quarantine and staying safer at home. And then what sort of happened is that it has allowed us to explore so many conservation topics from an angle that maybe we've never thought about. Um, I personally have gotten so much hope out of this series, out of hearing experts like the one we're going to hear from tonight, um, tell us about what's going on in the conservation sphere. And it's just given me such a feeling of confidence that we truly have our best people on the job. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to let Bridget introduce our guest and our topic because I'm so excited. I'm just going to let her do it. Thank you, Kate. Uh, yeah, so I'm Bridget Sanderson. I am the director of Environment Missouri based out of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I'm very excited for this discussion as well. Kate and I were trying to figure out a themed conservation conversations for the month of October. And, you know, we don't think that bats are spooky. We thought more along the lines of like, it'd be spooky without bats. So we figured we would learn more about bats. So I, I grabbed one of my very close friends, Beth Rogers, to come and help tell us about bats so we can have a conversation around bats. Um, so Beth Rogers is an ecologist interested in how bats and birds cope with energetic challenges like long distance migration. She has six years of experience studying bat ecology, including the impacts of white nose syndrome, and has worked as an environmental consultant monitoring bat fatalities at wind facilities in the Midwest. Beth graduated with an MS in biology from Texas Tech University in 2018 and is currently a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, yeah, so Beth, again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm, I'm so happy you're here. So um, I'm going to let you go ahead and kind of take control. Oh, wait, I'm so sorry, Beth. I interrupted you. Sorry. Uh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I did mean to say that uh, we will save questions for the end of the um, discussion. So uh, if you are on the webinar, just put them in the chat or the Q&A section and Kate and I will read them off. And then if you're on the Facebook live stream, just put in the comment, your questions in the comment section and we'll ask them at the end. And um, you know, as many questions as we get through too. So. Sorry about that, Beth. I will now let you take control. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not used to having the reins on these Zoom meetings. So uh, bear with me while I figure out how to share my screen. Um, thank you for that introduction, um, Bridget and Kate, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk about bats with all of you. So let's see, I am going to share my screen. Sorry for narrating this. <laughs> Okay, can you guys see this? Okay, cool. So I am going to talk to you about bats and something that kind of blew my mind when I first started learning about bats, especially having grown up in the Northeast, um, where we only have nine bat species and they're all small and brown. Um, so that's kind of what I thought of when I thought about bats when I was growing up. But in actuality, bats are the most widely distributed terrestrial mammal on Earth. Um, and there are over 1,400 species currently known. Um, and I'm showing you this map here to show you just how widespread bats are. Um, and truly, the only place where you can't find bats on the planet are um, in the Arctic in Antarctica and on certain islands in the ocean. And you'll see here, this graph is showing um, species richness, which is the number of species in a given area. And you'll see that 
there are many species of bats in the tropics, especially in Latin America, in Africa, and in Southeast Asia. In the US, we have about 40 species of bats, most of which are insectivorous, um, except for three species of fruit and nectar eating bats that migrate to California and the Southwest from Mexico. Um, so there is generally a greater bat diversity in the Southern US. Um, like I mentioned in Massachusetts, which is where I currently am, there are just nine bat species and the two most common species are the little brown bat and the big brown bat. But even though the bats that we're familiar with in the US are mostly small brown and insect eating, bats are actually extremely diverse, um, both in terms of their morphology, meaning their shape and size and color, but also um, the habitats that they um, inhabit, which include wetlands, woodlands, farmland, and urban areas. Um, so on this first slide here, I'm posing the question, why do bats matter? And I, I assume that everybody that's on this call probably doesn't need to be convinced that bats matter, um, but I do wanna talk about the role that bats play in our global e ecosystems. Um, so bats play many uh, roles that help maintain healthy ecosystems. Um, insectivorous bats, such as this Mexican free-tailed bat, um, manage insect populations, um, particularly moths. Um, the favorite moth of this species is the corn earworm moth, which is a major crop pest in the southern U.S. Um, but insectivorous bats also eat um, beetles, scorpions, uh, dragonflies, grasshoppers, a whole range of insects. We also have fruit and nectar feeding bats, which are essential pollinators um, for many plants in tropical and desert ecosystems. Um, so actually over 300 species of plants rely on bat pollination. Um, and these plants include agave, which is the plant that gives us tequila, um, as well as the cigarro cactus. So finally, frugivorous bats, such as this flying fox here, um, act as seed dispersers and are essential for reforestation in the tropics. So those are just a few examples of the types of roles that bats play in our ecosystem um, and just a short example of why they're so important. But often when we talk about bats, um, these aspects of their ecology are referred to as ecosystem services because generally bat conservationists have to convince people um, the bats are worth saving because they are beneficial to humans. And typically what that means is their um, economic um, impacts. So for example, one fact that gets thrown around a lot talking about bat conservation is the fact that bats save U.S. farmers or are estimated to save U.S. farmers um, $3.7 billion annually by reducing crop damage and the need for pesticides. And I think while these services are really important, I think it's also important to recognize that bats are worth conserving, not just because of what they do for us as humans, but because they are an important part of the global, the global ecosystem and have inherent value. So for me, bats, which honestly are weird and unique and interesting creatures, um, and to me encompass the feeling of awe and mystery that I have about the natural world. And more than anything else, I want people to experience that feeling and see the value in protecting our planet, not just for us, not just for what these animals can do for us, but um, to protect the planet for the sake of our non-human neighbors as well. And the reason I have this photo up here um, of the Congress Avenue bridge in Austin um, is, because, whoops, Austin is a really great example of what happens when we can change people's minds about bats and transform their, their feelings of fear or creepiness about bats into um, kind of interest and a love of bats. And truly, the people in Austin love bats. Um, so this bridge is home to a really huge colony of the Mexican free-tailed bat. Um, and 
every night from October until, or from April until October, you can go out onto this bridge and hundreds of people do every night. Um, and they watch this huge stream of bats emerge from under the bridge every night at sunset. Um, and it's pretty incredible. I've gone one time. Um, luckily, I had the opportunity to go and it was really fun. And it was also really amazing just seeing how excited everybody was to see the bats. And I think it just goes to show that for many things, but bats in particular, because they are nocturnal, people don't usually, you know, come across bats in their day-to-day -day life. They might not know that much about them. They might not know what they look like or um, that they're really not something to be feared. So I think, um, yeah, it's just a, a great example of how education and um, outreach, which Bat Conservation International, um, their headquarters is in Austin and they do a lot of work um, with outreach to kind of get people excited about bats. And um, it's really cool to see that in action. So anyway, I'll get off my soapbox now <laughs> about that. Um, before I kind of dive into the conservation um, issues surrounding bats, I do just want to introduce you to a few of my favorite bats. Okay, so as I said before, bats are a hugely diverse taxa. Um, bats eat a diversity of diets, including insects, arachnids, fish, and fruit, um, and they inhabit a diversity of habitats, including caves and trees. Um, and we also have some plant mutualists. So I wanted to introduce you to the greater bulldog bat, which is native to Latin America, and the fish-eating myotis, which lives around the Gulf of California. Um, these bats both hunt small fish and crustaceans, which I think is pretty incredible. Um, and as an example of adaptive evolution, you can see they have these giant feet that they use to scoop bats out of the water. And they use their echolocation um, not to find insects, but to detect movement in the water to help them locate fish. Next, we have the Honduran white bat, um, which is actually one of only six species of bats that have white fur, um, which is pretty incredible considering there's more than 1,400 species around the world. So these bats, um, they construct tents out of leaves by cutting the ribs of the leaf um, with their teeth so that it folds in on itself and forms a tent for them to roost in during the day. Um, I think maybe my absolute favorite bat is the Hardwick woolly bat, um, which is found in Southeast Asia. And these guys are so cool. They have a, mutualist, a mutualistic relationship with this species of pitcher plant. And if you know anything about pitcher plants, you know that they rely on getting their nitrogen, um, typically from insects that fall into the pitcher plant. But this species, they get their nitrogen from bat droppings. So they get nitrogen from the bat and the bat gets a nice safe place to roost during the day inside the pitcher plant. Um, we also have the Spix's disc winged bat, which is found in Latin America. Um, these guys have suction cups on their forearms and they roost during the day in rolled up leaves and they can stick themselves onto the inside of the leaf um, where they roost, which I think is pretty incredible. And then lastly, I wanted to introduce you to the Egyptian fruit bat. Um, these guys are really cool. They obviously eat fruit. And something that's interesting about fruit bats is that most fruit bats, um, actually they don't echolocate like most bats, um, and they have really good eyesight because they um, find their food by smell and by sight. But Egyptian fruit bats, they actually have the ability to do both. So they have really good eyesight, um, and you can tell because they have really big eyes, um, but they also have the ability to echolocate as well. So anyway, hopefully now, if you didn't like bats before, I've convinced you that they're pretty cool and interesting. So now I want to briefly just tell you about some of the research that I do. Um, so I study North American bats, and although mo most North American temperate bats hibernate in the winter to save energy during periods of um, low insect availability, 
availability. There are a few species such as the silver-haired bat, the Mexican free-tail bat, and the hoary bat um, that undergo long distance migrations similar to the seasonal migrations that we see in birds, um, though on average their migrations are not as long. Um, there are also several species of nectar feeding bats in Mexico and some flying foxes in Africa and Australia that also undergo these long distance migrations. Um, so one focus of my research is studying the shared adaptations um, to flight, which we know is really energetically costly and which has evolved independently in birds and bats. Um, so I'm looking at shared adaptations to both flight and to long distance migration um, in bats and birds. So if you're interested in any of that, feel free to contact me and talk to talk about this some other time. But for now, I'm going to move on um, and talk about conservation, which is why we're all here. So according to the IUCN, um, 24 bat species are critically endangered. 53 species are endangered. 104 species are considered vulnerable and 226 species are considered data deficient. So what that means data deficient is that because bats are nocturnal and elusive, they're really pretty hard to study um, and they're particularly understudied in regions um, with the greatest bat diversity, such as in the tropics. So one of the greatest challenges to bat conservation is the ability for conservation biologists to actually identify species that are in need of conservation efforts, um, and then the ability to prioritize and implement those conservation strategies where they are most needed. Um, and the biggest reason for that is because they are really understudied um, and more information is just needed that we don't have to be able to conserve them. So now I'm going to talk about some of the, sp the specific threats to bats worldwide. Um, I'm sure the first one, whoops, the first one won't come as a shock, um, climate change. So we already know that climate change is having a devastating effect on the planet's biodiversity. Um, the UN estimates that 150 to 200 species of plants, animals, and insects are currently going extinct every 24 hours. So for bats, um, the worst effects of climate change are the increased severity and frequency of extreme weather events, such as the heat strokes in Australia that have recently caused massive die-offs of flying foxes. Um, rising temperatures are also causing bat distributions to shift poleward, which may affect long distance migrants by causing mismatches between the timing of migration um, and the avail availability of seasonal food resources. For hibernating bats, changes in temperature and humidity may also affect um, the availability of suitable habitats for hibernation, which need to be cold and humid. So of course, the effects of climate change um, are not unique to bats, um, but in this context, we know that they may be worse for bat species that are sim simultaneously being impacted by habitat destruction. Um, so examples of this include um, logging and degradation of tropical rainforests, particularly in Southeast Asia, which we know to be a huge risk to global bat diversity. And this is because forests are um, arguably the most essential habitat for bats at a global scale, um, not just for uh, uh, roosting habitats, because we know only some bats actually live in forests, such as under foliage, under bark, or in tree hollows and cavities. But forests are also essential for cave dwelling species because they are um, essential foraging habitats. So in addition to um, deforestation, the conversion of land for agriculture is another significant land use change that's reducing bat populations through um, direct habitat loss and reduced foraging resources, which can occur both from land modification and the widespread use of pesticides. So again, these issues are not unique to bats, um, but they do highlight the importance of conservation efforts to protect forests and shift to lower intensity agricultural practices. So another huge 
threat to bats worldwide um, is hunting and persecution. So roughly 167 bat species are hunted for food and medicine, primarily in Southeast Asia and West and Central Africa. Currently, there aren't that many published estimates of population impacts from bushmeat hunting, but the few available studies indicate that harvest rates are very high in certain areas and appear unsustainable based on estimates of local bat population sizes. Unfortunately, bats are also intentionally killed for a variety of other reasons, including fear of zoonotic disease transmission, cultural fears, um, eradication of bats living in people's houses and other buildings, and culling of fruit eating species with the intention of reducing damage to fruit crops. So in addition to advocating for wildlife protection laws, the best thing we can do to save bats from persecution is to stop destroying their habitats. Um, because as these environments become increasingly human dominated, bat human conflicts are only going to become more common. Um, and in addition to this, bat biologists around the globe are also working with local communities to increase awareness surrounding hunting related declines of bats and to develop community driven conservation plans. So um, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to focus on the last two conservation issues, not the last two in total, but the last two that I'm going to talk about tonight, um, which are white nose syndrome and wind energy. Um, so these two issues are probably the most unique to North American bats, and they're also the two that I have the most personal experience with. So I would also like to refer you to the Bat Conservation International website um, if you have any more interest or questions about climate change, habitat destruction, and hunting. Um, there's a lot of great information online that you can check out. Okay, so from um, 2013 to 2016, I worked as a research assistant at Bucknell University to study immune responses in bats to white nose syndrome. So if you're not uh, familiar with white nose syndrome, it's a fungal disease that affects hibernating bats by growing on their wings and their noses anywhere without fur, um, causing behavioral changes during hibernation. So Essentially what happens is that it causes bats to warm up to their normal body temperature more frequently than they would normally throughout the winter. And so these changes ultimately throw off their energy budgets for the winter and cause them to burn through their energy, their winter energy stores too quickly, causing them to emerge from hibernation before spring food resources have become available. And this often results in starvation. So the fungus causing white nose syndrome was first introduced to the US in um, 2007, when it was assumed to have been transferred from either Europe or Asia, where we know the fungus is present, but doesn't affect the bats that live there. Um, but we assume that it was transferred from either Europe or Asia to a cave near um, Albany, New York by human activity. So since that happened, it has killed millions of bats in Eastern North America with mortality at some sites hitting almost 100%. And since then, it has spread to 37 US states and seven Canadian provinces and has spread as far west as Washington. So for reasons unknown, some species are much more susceptible to this fungus than other species. For example, um, the, big, the little brown bat has close to a 99% mortality rate. Um, but at the same time, other species are seemingly not affected by it. To date, 13 species have been infected in the U.S., including two federally endangered species, the gray bat and the Indiana bat. And this is, I don't think it's overstating it to say that this has caused one of the most significant losses um, to wildlife in the U.S. in the past century. Um, so the introduction of this fungus, the fungus that causes white nose syndrome to northeastern caves was kind of a perfect storm for cave dwelling bats. Um, the fungus grows really well in cold, damp places, which is the same climate that cave dwelling bats inhabit during the winter. And it also spreads very easily from bat to bat, 
And the bat species that have been most affected by it tend to clump together in large colonies and caves to help them regulate their body temperature. So because it's been so easy to transmit, the fungus spread really quickly across the eastern US from 2007 to 2015. So currently, um, researchers in the western US are working to predict how white note syndrome is going to spread across the western US and which species will be the most affected. Um, some bat ecologists predict that because of the type of habitat that's most um, common in the West, more mountains, fewer caves, um, they predict that hopefully the disease may not be as severe in the West as it was in the East. Um, unfortunately, I think that's going to be a situation where time will tell. Um, it seems like the spread is inevitable and several species are potentially facing extinction is the, the truth of the reality here. So I know it seems very hopeless. I, I want to end on maybe a more positive note here, which is that ecologists are working to develop treatments for the disease. It's unclear how feasible widespread deployment of these treatments could be in reality. Um, and I know many ecologists are also concerned about unintended consequences of um, deploying certain topical treatments to, into caves and how that might affect the cave ecosystems. Um, I think the best thing we can do is try as much as possible to stop the spread. Um, what that means for us and for people that like to visit caves is that if you do travel to caves, if you're a spelunker, um, the best thing you can do is to follow guidelines for disinfecting your clothes and gear in between cave visits. Um, the spores of this fungus can live for a very long time on your shoes and other caving equipment. Um, so I encourage you to um, go online. There's a lot of information, especially at whitenosesyndrome.org, with guidelines for how to best disinfect your equipment um, in between going to different caves. So I also want to um, mention that there are some populations of little brown bats that are being monitored in the East. Um, and there are a small number of them that have survived white nose syndrome. And they do seem to be resistant now to the disease. And so the hope is that they are able to pass on this, resistant to their, this resistance um, to their offspring. And hopefully over time, these species will be able to repopulate. Um, it might take a while, but that is one um, piece of hope, hopeful news that we have about white nose syndrome. Okay. So finally, um, I want to talk about wind energy development. And I know this is um, a huge topic right now, and wind energy development is happening really rapidly, which I'm sure everybody on this call can probably agree is a good thing. Um, However, there has been an unintended consequence of wind energy development, which is that um, birds and bats are at risk of um, being killed by the turbine blades. So that does not negate the importance of wind energy development, but it's something that um, is a conservation issue currently. So between 2000 and 2011, um, upwards of 1.3 million bats have been estimated to have died from um, turbine collisions and injury related to rapid barometric pressure change at wind turbines in the US and Canada. Um, today, estimates have increased. So currently, we're looking at um, 500,000 bats um, estimated to be killed annually. And that's um, especially true at wind energy sites on ridgetops in the eastern US. For some reason, fatalities are especially frequent there. So migratory bats, such as silver-haired bats and hoary bats, um, make up a large part of these casualties. So according to this paper published in the journal Biological Conservation in 2017, hoary bats are on track to decline by as much as 90% in the next 50 years if conservation measures to reduce mortality from turbine collisions are not initiated soon. Um, it's still somewhat of a mystery why bats are dying in such large numbers because of wind turbines. Um, a large proportion of these fatalities are 
um, occur during fall migration, which is also when the species most affected by um, turbine related fatalities mate during the year. Um, so one hypothesis, and it's just a hypothesis, um, but an idea is that um, these bats, which tend to be solitary for most of the year, are attracted to the turbines because they're often the tallest feature on the landscape. And that might not be the reason, but um, there is definitely something happening where these bats are attracted to the turbines. Um, and that's something that bat ecologists are trying to figure out. But a bigger issue is that in North America, migratory bat species lack regulatory protection. Um, we know from research that there are effective solutions for mitigating bat fatalities at turbine facilities. For example, limiting wind turbine operation at night during high risk periods um, like migration has been shown to reduce fatalities by as much as 93% with minimal impact on annual power generation. Um, other studies have found that um, just temporarily stopping wind turbines during low wind conditions, which is when these fatalities are most frequent, can reduce fatalities by as much as 87%. The Bats and Wind Energy Cooperative, which is a working group established by Bat Conservation International, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the American Wind Energy Association, and the US Department of Energy, um, has been developing ultrasonic deterrence devices that use um, sonar jamming sounds to deter bats from approaching the turbines. Um, but these devices are still in the research and development phase, um, and more research is needed on their efficacy and potential for widespread implementation. So from my perspective, the real challenge here is convincing wind energy companies to actually implement these conservation solutions. In 2017, four North American bat species, including hoary bats, were added to the Convention on Migratory Species, but the US is not a participant in the treaty and the listing does not impose transnational regulatory protection. Um, so there's no regulation that requires wind energy companies to comply. So in areas with endangered bat species, like the gray bat or the Indiana bat, um, wind companies are required to complete pre and post construction surveys to first predict fat, fat fatality risk and then once operational to continue monitoring um, fat fatalities. So after completing my master's degree in biology, where I studied bat migration, I worked for an environmental consulting company for a year conducting these surveys, um, which was an opportunity for me to kind of see how these surveys work on the ground. So as I mentioned before, and as I think everyone can agree, wind energy is important and necessary for us to transition away from fossil fuels in favor of renewable energy sources. But, uh, and it's a big but, given the speed at which turbine facilities are being built, it's extremely important that we take bats into consideration. Um, and hopefully in the future from a regulatory standpoint. And, to finish this conversation, I wanted to talk about how you can help bats. So these are pretty, you know, I think pretty easy things to do. Um, but one thing you can do is to make your backyard bat friendly. And what that means is um, maybe consider installing a bat house. So there's a lot of great information online about how to build and install bat houses. Um, I also did a quick Google search last night and there are some really nice ones from the Audubon Society that you can buy. Um, also, if you're, um, I think particularly if you live in the Southeast, um, you can consider leaving dead trees standing in your yard as long as they're not a safety hazard um, because some bats seek out tree hollows to roost. Okay, second one, and I know this is kind of controversial, but if you have a cat, and I'm sure you've heard this before, I hate to be the one to repeat it, but cat attacks really are one of the most common causes of bat and bird fatalities. Um, so I just ask, please consider keeping your cats inside. Okay, and this one, this is a fun one. <laughs> 
consider buying bat-friendly tequila and mezcal. So if you didn't know, industrial tequila production has led to declines in the tequila agave, which um, also is a loss of an important food source for the Mexican long-tongued bat and the lesser long-nosed bat. So the Tequila Interchange Project is a nonprofit organization started by um, bat biologist, Dr. Rodrigo Medellin, um, and it works to persuade tequila producers to let some of their plants um, bloom and die to maintain the food source for these bats. Um, and in exchange for doing this, they label their products um, bat friendly. So next time you're at the liquor store, keep an eye out and you might see um, a bat friendly tequila or mezcal. And finally, um, you can always support organizations like Bat Conservation International that are working to um, give bats a voice and conserve bats globally. And additionally, you can vote for representatives that support conservation, legislative, legislative action on climate change and environmental justice. And finally, you can talk to people about bats and why they should care about them. And that's the end of my presentation. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Beth. That was fascinating and I loved learning about it. Um, especially all the pictures with the really cute bats. Um, I am going to start off with just a question to kind of get the ball rolling. Again, if you are on the Facebook live stream, just put your questions in the comment section. And if you're on the webinar, just put it in the chat or the Q&A session, section and we will read it out to Beth. But I was, um, I mean, I feel like you answered most of my questions that I was writing down during it. So wonderful job. Um, but I was curious, do you happen to know which specific pesticides are harmful for bats? That's a really great question. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I think a big issue is um, the insects themselves consuming the pesticide and then the bat um, eats a bunch of these insects. So I'm not sure what specific pesticides are the most harmful, but um, another thing to consider is the fact that the, the effects of the pesticides can often be amplified the further up the food chain you go. Um, and these bats, especially Mexican free tail bats, they can eat um, basically their body weight in insects in a given night. Um, so if you think about that, you can imagine how detrimental those pesticides could be. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, similarly to Bridget, I would jot down a question and then the next thing you would say would answer that question. Um, I did want to, I found it from a quick search, this fact sheet on bat friendly tequila that I'll put in the chat for people, but it doesn't actually, I don't know if I'm even allowed to ask this, but it doesn't mention any brands. Do you know if there are, I think I'm allowed to ask that, right Bridget? Yeah. Do you, do you have a favorite bat friendly tequila brand? That is a good question. I actually, I don't know that this has, um, how common bat friendly um, designation is yet. I think it's kind of a work in progress. I know um, the brand that um, Dr. Median works with is, I think it's called Tequila Ocho, um, but I think it's mostly currently um, Mexican brands, and I'm not sure which, um, which brands that we can purchase here have it yet, but hopefully, you know, in the future, there'll be a lot more um, for us to choose from in terms of bat friendly tequila. Bridget and I will get on that. That'll be our next big campaign. Yeah, well, let me, yeah, let me know what you find. <laughs> um, I will just say that I do know Kansas City has tequila Ocho. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna go through uh, the Facebook questions. I'm sorry, I saw a couple at the top, so you may have also answered these throughout because you did such a thorough job, but we'll just get the second amount, the, the second answer for it. Um, so the first question is how many bats do we have left in North, North America? Yeah, so um, currently no bats have gone extinct yet. 
um, from white nose syndrome or from wind energy. Um, we have about 40 species in the US um, and Canada. Um, and there is greater bat diversity in the southern US, um, particularly the southwest and Texas, um, because they get migrants that come up from Mexico. But in the northeast where I am, we have nine species. Um, I was trying to find the question here that I'd written from someone as well. Um, should people be concerned about disease spread to humans by bats who are living in your yard or on your property in your garage is our reality? That's a, a really good question. Um, yeah, I'm going to be pretty blunt about this. The answer is no. Like truly the risks from bats especially the risk from rabies, for example, is so, so, so low. And so that's, they don't want to bite you. They don't want to be near you. Um, so I think the truth of the matter is that as long as, you know, you let the bats be um, and you don't try to handle them, um, then, no, there is no risk of disease transmission from bats. All right, I've got another one from Facebook. Um, it's a clarifying question. What is the name again of the white fur bats and where do they live? Um, that's the Honduran white bat. Um, and I believe it's in Honduras. <laughs> But there are, yeah, there are other um, white bats. There's also the ghost bat, which is in Australia. And they're really cool as well, so. Immediately Googling that. <laughs> um, go ahead, I'm sorry. I just wanna clarify about the um, disease question because I know this is kind of a tricky topic with bats. Um, so specifically for people in the US, I think that's, the clarifying point about rabies is um, for us here, there's very little risk. Um, of course, you know, I'm sure I, I was expecting to get a question about COVID, so I might just address it now. <laughs> That's okay. So there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of misinformation about um, zoonotic disease spillover from bats, um, specifically with COVID-19. Um, the link between bats and COVID-19 has not been established scientifically. Um, they are suspected to harbor the disease because um, we know that they carry the closely related virus, um, which is SARS-CoV-1. Um, but the thing with this topic is that bats, for some reason, they're um, immune systems, their physiology is unique in a way that we don't quite understand yet, um, that allows them to carry these viruses without any negative harm to the bats themselves. And so there have been known viruses that have spilled over into humans through, typically through an amplifying host. Um, for example, pangolins are suspected to be the amplifying host for um, COVID-19, though again that has not been formally established. Um, I think the point that I hope to be able to make tonight is that um, even though these bats do harbor these viruses, the reason that they've spilled over into humans is because you know we're encroaching on their habitat and we're coming into contact more with these bats than we should be because you know in an ideal world like we would not be coming into contact we would not be um coming into their habitats so again there is a lot of research being done on viral spillover um, dynamics in bats um, but i would say for especially in the us it's not something that um, most people need to worry about Thank you so much for addressing that and for clearing so much of that up. That's really, really interesting and really helpful. Um, this is, I really am interested about, I like this question a lot. 
how, hey Beth, great job, first of all. Uh, <laughs> it says, how would you like to see the negative pop culture perception of bats change? That's a really great question. Yeah, I would love that. I think more than anything, um, bats traditionally have a pretty bad reputation that I think is wholly undeserved. Um, and I think with anything that gives people reason to be fearful, it's because we don't understand enough about it um, or we don't come into contact with it in our day-to-day -day lives. I think um, with bats, you know, most people just don't, don't um, see bats even, especially now in the Northeast, that populations have been so reduced, you know, you might go your whole life and never see a bat. Um, and so I think when all you know about something is what is being told in stories or in pop culture, um, I mean, it's understandable why people have these negative connotations, um, but I think really um, bats are pretty amazing and there's nothing to be afraid of. Um, and so I think, and I do, I do really think that their reputation is changing because a lot of people have worked really hard to change people's perceptions about bats. And I think that as that continues, I'm hoping that um, people will be less and less afraid of bats and be more excited about them. That's great. I feel like Dracula ruined it for him. <laughs> Um, okay, so I've got another one from Facebook. Is there an existing database of active bat helpers or handlers by region? We are entering a time of year where many bats are found injured. It would be good to know where to find these systems. And I will just say it really fast. I know, Beth, this is a question for you and you would know the answer way better than I would. But uh, we did have a former conservation conversations guest uh, from Lakeside Nature Center. So if you're from the Kansas City, Missouri area, they're a great one, but Beth, you, or Beth, Beth, you go. Um, yeah, I, I'm actually not sure if there is a database, um, but I know that there are um, many wildlife rehabbers that are um, do a lot of great work to protect bats um, and rehabilitate them, which is amazing. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry, um, but I know that they exist and I know that I've always been able to find um, local rehabbers just with a quick Google search. So I guess that's what I would encourage. Okay, that's a good question. Now I'm thinking about that. Um, so this next question is, you mentioned certain bats being hard to track down and the numbers being difficult to get data on. How do scientists know uh, when a species is endangered versus just really good at hiding? That is a, that's a fantastic question. And actually um, the paper that I briefly talked about um, regarding hoary bat population declines um, due to wind turbine collisions, that, that paper was really interesting because before the um, biologists that produced that paper were able to estimate um, when we might expect the species to go extinct, first they had to estimate their population size because they didn't know um, because these bats, especially um, temperate tree roosting bats are really elusive and there aren't really formal estimates of how many of them are even out there. So I'm not sure exactly the methods that they used, but um, they, I think, just took all of the data that currently exists about the, this species, hoary bats, for example, um, either from you know, previously published research studies or um, other monitoring efforts they were able to take all of that data together and then using statistical methods, they were able to estimate what the population size might be in a given um, conf confidence interval. And so the numbers that I presented about hoary bat declines, which I think said that 90% of the population could 
be gone by 2050. That is a that is I think their most conservative estimate. So it might not be that their population is that will be that declined by 2050. But given that we don't actually know exactly how big their population size is, um, it's always better to play it safe and act on the conservative side. Um, okay, we have a couple more questions in the webinar and I think we're caught up on Facebook. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask, um, Will bat populations ever be able, I feel like you already kind of answered this, but let's go back over it. Will bat populations ever be able to recover from white nose syndrome? I think the answer is hopefully. Um, we don't know for sure. And I think it's hard to say whether it will, whether they will ever um, recover to the size of the population that they had before white nose. Um, we also don't know how fast it might happen, um, but yeah, again, hopefully, um, and a lot of people are studying that exact question and working on it. So hopefully we have an answer, if nothing else, soon. Um, I won't lie, while you were talking about that, I did write, we need a tiny bat vaccine in my notes. <laughs> um, I think people are, people are working on that, but I think the issue is how to actually administer a vaccine to bats that are in a cave. Right. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of logistic, logistical issues, I think, with um, treatment. So I think a lot of people are focusing more on stopping the spread. Um, That's good. Um, OK, and then if you make a backyard home, a bat home, of course, What's the recommended distance so you don't get too close to them? Well, um, I have seen people um, putting up bat, house, bat houses just on the side of their house. Um, I don't think that's an issue, actually, um, as long as it's high enough off the ground. Um, but I know, I think in terms of uh, the best places to put your bat house, um, there's a lot of information online. I think um, something to look into is where, um, what direction the bat house faces because bats like um, a certain temperature. So finding the right um, amount of sunlight is important too. But I think, yeah, I think putting a bat house on the side of your house is totally okay. Um, also putting it far away from your house is okay. Um, so I think we are caught up with questions. I did just want to mention in the chat on Facebook, um, we did get a, and, and you, I don't know if you know this, Joanna on Facebook, if we don't know, we can connect you to our Environment Florida director who might know. Um, she says, I took a Florida, a, I think Florida, Master Naturals class and someone mentioned a wildlife crossing at SR 29 with 200 plus Brazilian free-tailed bats. Wow. I don't know exactly where it is, but hope to figure it out in order to witness them. You heard anything about this, Beth? I haven't, but that sounds about that sounds about right. Yeah, Brazilian free-tailed bats. Um, they form these huge colonies um, during the summer, and it's mostly the females um, that they form maternity colonies where they have their babies and they kind of help each other raise their babies. So I've heard of yeah, I've, that sounds about right um, for Florida. In Texas, there are colonies that are hundreds of thousands of bats in a given summer roost. So that sounds about right. And I hope that um, Joanna gets to see those bats someday. <laughs> All right, Beth, thank you again so much for coming on. This was fascinating and I, I didn't know that I could love bats more than I already did. Um, so I really appreciate that. Uh, again, thank you everybody else for coming on to Conservation Conversations and joining in, in the conversation. Um, if you like the work we're doing, consider um, supporting or giving a donation to Environment Maryland, Environment Missouri. Beth, I don't think that you have any place, but we'll say the Bat Conservation International. How about? <laughs> Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> um, and then also follow Beth on uh, Twitter if you would like. She so you can get more bat facts. 
Uh, she is at Beth J. Rogers as well. So um, thank you again so much, Beth. And Kate, do you have anything else to add? Um, I also thought this was fascinating and I, I really appreciate your framing of, you know, caring about bats for bats sake and not for ours. Um, and I just thought that was such an important, important thing to think about. Um, and I wanted to say that everyone's homework as we head into Halloween is to explain to one person at least uh, that bats deserve a much better reputation and tell them something that bats have maternity colonies, which is adorable. Um, and challenge some of these stereotypes that we're going to start seeing, especially during this season. But Beth, does that sound good to you as homework? Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for having me. This has been fun. And um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, a quick reminder too is we are monthly format now, so we will see you the second week of November. Um, and so keep an eye out for that information. So Bridget, anything else? I think that's it. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you in November.